Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, the topic of our meeting is the beginning of a lifetime practice. Um, this... What, what we've done is um, the reading from the big book, page 69 to 71. This is the outline of the, the, the topic. So I'm going to ask my friend Sue to come over and read this. My name is Sue, and I'm an alcoholic. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it, or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? We reviewed our conduct over the years past. Where have we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom have we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. In this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. What is selfish or not? We asked God to mold our ideals and help us to live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow towards it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, providing that we do not bring about still more harm in doing so. In so doing, sorry, in other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what should we do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with persons is often desirable but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we are going to get drunk? Some people tell us so. But this is only half-truth. It depends on us and on our motives. If we are sorry for what we have done and have honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. To sum up sex... We earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of our needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge where to yield would mean heartache. If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, 
We have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill to all, all men, even our enemies, for we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We have you convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. If you have already made a decision and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. Thank you. The speakers for the meeting are, we're going to have in that order, Sean, Chantal, Morris, and Walter. It's not exactly the same as this, but that's what was done here. So we're going to have no breaks in between, so we'll start with Sean and we'll go right through. So thanks. All your Sean. Good morning, friends. My name is Sean, and I'm an alcoholic. The moment has finally arrived. The moment I was dreading. But anyway, we'll make the best of it. Uh, just before we start on the, the alcoholism lesson, it says there, Sean B. Nelspreet Gauteng. Gauteng, uh, Nelspreet is in Mpumalanga. But fortunately, if my chaise is, is bad, it's the Sean from Gauteng. Not the one from Mpumalanga. My friends, this morning as I was walking down here, trying to prepare something for this morning, and one thing I've realized about sharing at conventions is that we cannot prepare. The preparation is my journey. My journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. That is my preparation for what I stand here today. So what I can tell you is the path I took to get to where I am. If we look at the steps, we look at the book, we look at the steps, it's written in the past tense. It's not in the present tense, it's not in the future tense. These are the steps you should take. These are the steps we took. And so this morning... I look at our, 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 our topic for this morning. I look at the topic for the entire AA meeting for the weekend, our primary purpose. And that's what I, I changed it from our primary purpose to my primary purpose. So the big letter, the big my and the big I is the responsibility I have in Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, before I used to look at AA as AA, them, them. Those are the people that need to carry the message. I need to tell people to come to meetings. That's as far as it goes. But we have to change that. Whenever anyone reaches out for help, I need to be there. That is the big I in AA and the big my. My primary purpose. So my primary purpose as I stand here this morning is particularly for those who are still new in Alcoholics Anonymous. For those that are still walking the path, those that are battling in this journey, is to come and tell you conclusively that we have the solution. Because these are the steps I took to get to the place I find myself in. And so as I'm walking down the, the, the road, there's a couple of, what do we call them, vagrants, people like me, alcoholics that are, are sleeping on the streets here, and people ask me, aren't you scared to walk past there? I say, no, I don't fear at all, because I'll tell them where I'm going to take them, and they'll run like hell. And the fact of the matter is, 
That's what I did for about 18 years of my life. At the mention of the word AA, my first reaction was to run. That's what I did. I was good at that. And so just like them, I know exactly how to, how, how to <laughs> make sure they don't rob me. I know where I'm taking them to probably sounds worse than prison. I want to just read something that's very close to my heart. This is something written by Bill. In 1958, he wrote a letter to the grapevine. And he says, sobriety, freedom from alcohol, through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps, is the sole purpose of an AA group. It's the only purpose. There's no other purpose. Many times in our meetings, people will argue about whether the chairs must be round or square. That is not the purpose. We can sit on the floor, but as long as we keep to our primary purpose, and that is to help the still-suffering alcoholic. So for those of you who are new, you are in the right place. You see, in, in, in the book... It says, there's a chapter that says there is a solution, not many solutions. And at the bottom of the, 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 the first page, it says, this is the great message that this book carries. And once we have read this book, we become the messengers of that message. That's what we do verbally. So sobriety, freedom from alcohol through the teaching and practice of the 12 step is the sole purpose of an AA group. How the steps are conveyed is verbally. We tell stories that illustrate the 12 steps. We relate such biographical information as provides a context for the real substance. The real substance is the 12 steps. I relate my biographical detail of my life, but in relation to the 12 steps where I was. So as provides a context for the real substance, which is how we know we are alcoholics, what we have done about it, and what the results have been. That's all it is about. At the end of his letter, he says, to sum up, AA meetings are most effective when they focus not on recounting the events of the past and excessive biographical biographical detail, all the gory stuff of our life, but on sharing the solution to our problem. That's what it's about. In the chapter to the solution, uh, there is a solution. Bill talks about the passengers of a ship, these ocean liners. That was when the time when, when ocean liners just started coming out. And he talks about the guys at the bottom in the steerage. The steerage is the bottom of the ship. Those are where all the poor people, the poorest of the poor, remain in the steerage. And then the captains, the top section is for the top guys, the rich, to captain's table. Those are the guys that share with the captain's table. And what is the common peril that unites them? Is when that ship sinks. But when they land at the harbor... They look at each other and they say, you rich, I'm poor, we've got nothing in common. Goodbye. Never to see each other ever again. So what is it that binds us as Alcoholics Anonymous? Is the common solution, not the common problem. The common problem is what created disunity in our lives. The common solution is what creates unity. And as long as we as a group do not function and practice the 12 steps, we fail, and those that are still suffering will never have a chance of recovery. And so we need to, to know that this is our responsibility in life. If I give you a little bit of a history about my life, I, I said I will, I, will, I will relate it in the steps. Obviously, the first step, the, my coming to Alcoholics Anonymous resulted was a weekend where I went to my nephew's wedding. To this day, I don't know where the church is, and I don't know where the reception was, but I was there. <laughs> the photos prove it. But I got no idea. But the Monday morning, I knew 
my family is going to be at me. And the only solution is to tell them I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous tonight. And that was the shortest lecture I got on the Monday morning. And everyone was so excited about it, so I had to find this AA. And the night that I arrived at AA, I found, I saw some people. I saw some, some happiness around here. And I knew what I was missing all my life. I was missing peace. I had no serenity. And alcohol suddenly became no problem anymore because I knew what was fundamentally wrong with me. I knew I was hurting. I was in terrible, terrible pain. And that's all I needed to get out was that pain. The alcohol was a crutch for my pain. I had to find another way. But the alcohol drove me further into pain because it drove everyone away from me. So I had to find the solution to that pain. And that was, that was a revelation to me. I said, oh, now I know what's been missing. Now I know what's been missing. And that night, I went home. And I, I, it was the first time in my life that I never wanted God to do anything for me. I always prayed, God, do this for me, do that for me. It's the first time I said, Lord, you know what? I messed up my life. I only want you to walk with me. I'm not interested in what you can do for me. I only want to walk this path with me. So when we look at this, the first steps, the powerlessness and the unmanageability is something I never understood. I was powerless over alcohol. The weekend proved that. Unmanageable to me was I couldn't manage my alcohol. <laughs> I was broke, lost my everything. That was my unmanageable part of my life. But the more I went into Alcoholics Anonymous, I realized what the unmanageability of my life was. I started to find that out. And so in the first night of my Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, I believed that I did the first three steps. The first three steps. The second step came to believe. We just, I had no belief at that point in time. But the one thing I could do was make the decision. I could make the decision. I didn't know how I'm going to get about it. How are we going to accomplish this? But I, I could make the decision and say, today I'm giving my will and my life over to the care of God. And that, my friends, is instant relief. We sing the song Amazing Grace. The hour I first believed. We sing it so wonderfully. You know, um, the, the last the line. How precious did that grace appear? It just, it appeared the hour I first believed. The instant I first believed. So what has happened is, if, if I give you what had happened in my life, I had two vehicles in the scrapyard. I owed over half a million on those vehicles. Insurance wouldn't pay because of drunkenness. <laughs> I'd lost everything. House, car, children, you name it. So that's... The gory details, everyone, most would understand. So I was sitting with this problem. I owe almost a million bucks. What do I do with this problem? The third step says I need to hand over my will and my life over to the care of God. And what did I have to do? I had to hand over the, the whole problem over. Lock, stock, and barrel. And once I had done that, the problem still existed, but it didn't exist in my mind. It no longer existed because it was now in the hands of someone, something much greater than I could ever imagine. And the relief was instant. It was instant. That's the beauty. That's the beauty. And so we proceeded. I knew that... It tells us that the third step is just but the beginning. It says next we launched. Launched. Launch is not next we started, next we what? We launched. That's what they do with the space shuttle. They launch it under tremendous power and immediately. And that is what, 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 what brought me to that place they talk about in the fifth, after in the fifth step, they say, yes, we've started to have spiritual it believes and etc. That's what we have in the fifth step. We start to have those, we start to feel his nearness. And the ninth promise, it tells us, yes, we had some spiritual beliefs, etc. But now we start to have spiritual experiences. 
we start to have spiritual experiences. Now, when we go through the fourth step, the honesty is the only part that is required, nothing else. We make it difficult because we don't want to be honest. <laughs> That's as simple as it goes. Now, I didn't, didn't have many sponsors or sponsors that I could hold on to because I read the book about five times in one week. And sometimes the sponsors didn't match up to what I saw in here. What was my next step? And this is a recommendation to everyone. This is what I did. Joe and Charlie. At the beginning, my first meeting was looking in the cupboards. You saw this thing, Joe and Charlie, the big book study. And that's what I, I latched on to. I was totally amazed. What people told me, the fourth step, this is how it works. That's how it works. Joe and Charlie explained it in just complete detail. Absolutely, in two words. So what are we trying to discover? Not my life story. I'm trying to discover what I don't know about myself. And I try to discover those things that I've kept on denying. That's all I had to discover. The fact that I had fights with you, 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 was relevant. But really irrelevant in the bigger sense of the word. That's why it said when Sue read, at the end we start absorbing and picking up great chunks of truth about ourselves. That's what I discovered. And in my fourth step, what did I discover? I discovered that it was of no consequence who I got married to. I would have still been divorced. That was a wonderful discovery. Wow. Oh, man. So it doesn't matter. That's who I was. That's who I was. But I didn't know that before. My wife was to blame for everything. So do you see the new discovery in my life? And Bill tells us, selfishness, self-centeredness, that's the root of my problem. I had to find, when, when we talk about our higher power, about God as we understand God, we've actually physically got to go on the search for God. That's why it says, we physically got to remove our resentments. So when I did my fourth step, and as an example of my my wife, my ex-wife. What did I discover? That I would have been divorced anyway. I started to love her. Just I, I saw, but it's not your fault. It's my fault. Like the book would say, yeah, what's wrong, wife? What's the wife nags? Gee, she nags. Then we look at the end. And why does she nag? I come home at three o'clock drunk every day. Stop that, and the nagging might stop. And this is just all that I needed to know. And, and, and that's the, 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 the importance. You know, and so in doing the fourth step, the fifth is what I tell what I've discovered. Not the gory past and all that. I say exactly what was found in here. Who is Sean? Really, who is he? Because he'd know himself for 40 years. What he was really doing was running from himself. And now, I'm not perfect. I don't have to run away from the truth anymore. There was a time in my sobriety. Look, fortunately my kids were small, so they grew up. In a, a, my, my daughter is 21 now, I'm almost 10, so she was 11, the other one was about 3 or 4, the 6 years gap. So they grew up in AA, and I shared my life with them, my life with them. And it wasn't, it wasn't long ago, something was happening. I was building up some anger, and my daughter said, Daddy, you have an anger problem. <laughs> oh, jeez. Now the old style, Sean, who the hell are you to <laughs> come and tell me i got an anger problem? But all I needed to do is to stand back, look at what she said. And I saw she's actually speaking the truth. Wow. Relief was once again immediate. I knew what the problem was. I just had to say, God, now we have to sort this thing out. Please. <laughs> you know I leave everything in your hands, so now just <laughs> handle this business. But once again, I had to just do an inventory, a quick inventory that we become good at once we practice it. I knew where the problem lied. 
lay, but I was also, you know, we tend to hide now and again. Okay. And I brought it back out. And once again, the problem was solved. The problem was solved. So all those are part of the steps. How the beginning of a lifetime practice, the way I look at it, is how do I stay sober? Steps 10, 11, 12. Continue to take personal inventory. And the beauty is that those two, the 10 and 11, is like three, four pages. It's not a lot of pages. And it tells you precisely, you wake up in the morning, this is what you do. Ask God that my thoughts, my actions be divorced from self-pity, self-centeredness, selfishness. That's it. See, the beauty about this is Bill was no, he wasn't a meditation specialist. He was a drunkard, just like us. So fortunately, he didn't know how it worked. He says, no, this is what you must do. Get up in the morning, say, right, God, today, <laughs> sort out my life. At night, I sit. What did I do wrong? Forgive me. Do I need to, do I need to ask someone's forgiveness? Yes or no? Tick, tick. The boxes are ticked less and less as we grow. We still tick the boxes. <laughs> We're gonna tick those boxes forever. But they do become less. But the reality is that our deadly, our deadly, deadly defects are removed by God when we ask Him. Those are the ones that destroyed my kids. Those are the ones that destroyed the people around me. Those have been taken. So the mistakes I make nowadays are easily corrected. They are not disastrous. What I did before was to destroy people's lives forever. So the relationship, the life I live now, wow, it's, it's, my problems are wonderful. When we were traveling with my two kids and my grandson, my eldest daughter, Daddy, don't you think you and Mommy should get back together? Then the 14-year-old is also chipping her, her little chair in there. And this is the reason I think you all should or shouldn't. And so, I say, but I don't think Mommy wants me back. You think, because, you know what? That's, I live in God's hands. He said, but Daddy, Mommy is hurting. You need to sort her out. I say, ish. Okay, now give me the tips. Now my eldest daughter, she say, no, we women are like this, you see. We are like, this is how you must treat us. No, you must, no, you must take mommy out for coffee. Yeah, what am I going to say to mommy now? This is at midnight driving <laughs> from, from Nelspreet, talking to my kids, my 14-year-old and my, my other daughter. But this is the life, this is the kind of problems we face now. What a beautiful problem to have. I see, I, I've got to close but quickly, give me two more, just, what does, what does people, what does AA ask of us for the newcomer? It's, it's this little thing, it was a, a slight little thing that I read somewhere about a very rich man. He heard about a French guy that could walk on a tightrope, blindfolded, with a wheelbarrow, push the wheelbarrow across. So this American guy is a very wealthy guy, he said, I'll pay you top dollar. Because I don't believe you can do this. Come over to New York and walk across the Niagara Falls. And I'll pay you. So the Frenchman said, yes, I'll do that. I'll do that. So he came across. And he did it. He walked across, blindfolded, walked across the Niagara Falls. So he asked the American, do you believe that I can do this? He says, yeah, look, it's quite impressive. A Frenchman says, no, do you believe that I can do this? Yeah, it's a, you know, yeah, you showed us. Look, it's impressive. You walked across here. He persisted. He said, do you believe I can walk across the Niagara Falls with my wheelbarrow blindfolded? So the American said, yes. He says, well, jump in. We're going back. <laughs> this is what AA asks of us. Just jump in. Jump in lock, stock, and barrel. You see the steps. We don't have to like them. Let's just do them. We want what they have. Let's just do what they do. And it's, it's that simple. Many a times, I'll give you simple examples like the fourth step. There's a group, there's a group that I went to. They smoke. They smoke in their, their group. But they're in an Anglican hall and the priest came in there 
And they said, guys, I don't like your smoking in the hall. So they put everything away, and they were mumbling, you know, in disapproval when the priest left. So I said, guys, y'all are practicing what destroyed y'all, self-centeredness. So as a group, has anyone in this group done the fourth step? Because you'd know, this is not your church, this is not your hall. The priest asked you guys not to smoke here, and it's self-centered. Bill tells us, and you're still practicing it. No, guys. And this is the story. This is how it goes. As groups have to go back and say, listen, guys, are we actually self-centered, or are we focused on our primary purpose? That's as simple as it goes, guys. The love story started nine and a half years ago. And the woman mustn't throw tomatoes at me, please. You discover a pretty woman, and then you start unraveling everything. And you find, oh, jeez, I made a mistake. And what happens? The initial love fades. In AA, I came to AA just over nine and a half, nine over nine years ago. And the more I discovered, the more my love grew for AA. So to all of you newcomers, I say start your love affair with Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a great journey. Thank you for listening. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chantal, and I am a very grateful alcoholic. Um, I was actually, you know, hoping that Sean would just go on and on and on. So I was just getting into my time. Cool. <laughs> go on with it. But I am really grateful to be here. I mean, this is scary. Um, I was telling my friend next to me earlier, oh, no, my gosh, I need to go to the toilet. And he's like, no, don't go to the toilet. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not going to go. Um, but you know what? When I was contacted um, by the chairperson, with regards to the readings and stuff like that. And I, and I read the page and I'm like, oh my word, you want to, sp- you want to speak about sex? No, not going to happen. You know, this really uncomfortable. No, you know. Um, so all I'm going to say about that is that, um, I got married last year, October. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. And, and yeah, that's the end of that. <laughs> um, you know, I, this morning I was I was sitting um, in in my prayer room and I was I was doing some reading and and pray and stuff like that. And um, the message in in the daily reflections, the title of the message, is that the the teaching is never over. And I thought that is such a, a ties in so beautifully with, you know, the beginning of a lifetime practice. Because when, you know, I'm a teacher, so when I teach, um, I expect my students to actually put it into practice. And if they can't put it into practice, then that means they haven't learned the lesson. And that means I'm going to have to teach them again. Um, I'm a dancer. I love dancing. And it's just, I was thinking about how, you know, with dancing, um, how, you know, if I don't listen to my instructor then the dance is going to be wrong. You know, it's, it's not going to flow. Um, and my partner and I will clash, and we'd have to practice over and over again in order to get that dance to be beautiful or say or whatever we want, you know. And Calvin would understand that we used to dance together. Um, and dancing is such a beautiful thing, and it reminds me so much of, of the relationship that one has or that I have with, with my higher power in that the moment I try and do my own steps, you know, I want to I wanna go right, and, and, and he's actually telling me to go left. It doesn't flow, you know, it's hakkerig, you know, it, it tramp on each other's toes, and, and it just doesn't work that way. So, and the moment I let go, and I trust my partner, and I allow him to lead me, and then it flows, you know, and it becomes what it's supposed to be, um, which is which is beautiful. I really do love dancing, so it it, it can be such a beautiful thing. Um, you know, I was very honoured um, when when I received an email from the chairperson a couple of weeks ago, 
to share today. And, um, you know, I was gonna, you know, really rigorously and averagely get into preparing for this day. <laughs> but I got sick and, and I've been sick for, for about three weeks now. And, um, I was in bed most of the time or I was in pain a lot of the time. Um, so I was, you know, to the end, like in this week, I was just hoping that I'd be okay just to be here, um, which I am, thank God. Um, but I was in pain for three weeks. And now I can't focus on, on what I need to do in my mind, you know, sit and, and write like this beautiful thesis and or essay about, you know, the beginning of a lifetime practice and stuff. And this whole sex thing is just like, I don't know what to, um, but I can't because I'm, you know, I'm sitting in so much pain and, and, and I'm getting frustrated. Um, and I'm scared, you know, it's, it's, it's a scared experience. I don't know what's wrong with me. I've been in, I've been seeing doctors and, and, you know, I've got another doctor's appointment next week and maybe you'll tell me and, and I'm afraid because it could be anything. Um, but anyway, so I, look, I don't even tell my sponsor this, that I'm, that I'm sitting in a lot of pain and, and I'm frustrated and so on. And, and I become really resentful. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming resentful at, at my colleagues. You know, I'm, I'm very peed off with, with my principal and I'm peed off with this one and I'm upset with that one and my in-laws and my sister's in-laws and I just don't like people. <laughs> you know, the life, the world would be just a beautiful place if it wasn't for other people. So I'm there and, and eventually I, I decide to, you know what, actually no. Um, and I sit down and I do a review on this and I get it all out of me and stuff like that. And I feel better for doing it. And you know, the, the review of the step 10 is very much like a step four. It's like a mini step four. It's really like cleaning house. Because when I'm sitting in a dirty house, I'm really uncomfortable, you know. Um, I like cooking, for example. And if I go into the kitchen and there's dishes and it's just dirty and, the, you know, the, 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 the counters are dirty and there's dirty plates all over the place and there's spots and whatever, I need to clean up first before I can actually do something else there. And so for me, these steps are very much, especially step four and ten, are very much steps that, that sort of clean up, you know, it, it gets the muck out of the way, uh, the dirt that's just, that makes you feel so uncomfortable, you know, within your own space, within your own skin, you're just so uncomfortable. And so I'm resentful at all these people and, um, you know, my sponsor, my sponsor tells me that, you know, with regards to my illness, I, um, you know, we're not entitled to anything, we're not entitled to either the good or the bad, you know. And that sort of downsized me um, in that I had to realize that I'm actually not entitled to anything. But you see, the problem with me is that um, I think that I am <laughs> entitled to, to the good all the time. And, you know, it's difficult because I have this, and, and I get resentful because, you know, um, and I hold on to these resentments. That's why it took me so long to actually just tell my sponsor because I just, I like holding on to them. I nurse them, you know, um, because I have this childish grandiosity that I just, uh, that, you know, my life is supposed to be better than this. And, and thus far in sobriety, I've, I've had a fairly happy, joyous and free sobriety. You know, I've, I've had that. And last year, for example, I got married and, and, you know, I finished my studies. I got my degree and, you know, I got to dance and it was just amazing. And so now I'm five months married and I get so sick, you know, and so how dare God do this to me? And I have this, you know, I tend to think that, that I deserve misery, you know, that I actually don't deserve love or that I deserve misery. And so, okay, yes, you know what? You did so many things wrong in, in the past and, and even in sobriety because, you know, just because we get sober or just because I got sober doesn't mean that my head is all of a sudden <laughs> saying, you know, I'm still, the head still goes. <laughs> so. I need to work on that all the time, you know. And, and I think all of us sort of have that thing where we sort of wake up in the morning and the washing machine starts going already, early morning. So my head, I need to keep in check all the time. And that's my disease, and I know that. But anyway, in my model of the world, you know, I am entitled to everything um, um, because cause just I am. I'm special and different. I, I have so many reasons why I should be entitled to things. Um, 
And, you know, I, I was reading some things, and, and, and I read in the um, emotional sobriety, I, something that really resonated was, with me was that if drinking is not going to bring you to your knees, sobriety will, you know. And, and I, think, I think that's where I'm at right now, is that sobriety is, is bringing me to my knees. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm sitting with this childish grandiosity and I don't want to go of, let go of my, my defects of character, even though I say so, you know, because it, the thing is, you know, it's, it's a program of honesty and this is what this step is all about is, is being honest with yourself first, you know, and it's not comfortable digesting huge chunks of oneself. You know, I don't always want to digest huge chunks of myself, you know, because then I get to see my own selfishness and self-centeredness. Um, and so it's not comfortable, but it's even more uncomfortable to sit where I was sitting, you know, like a friend of mine told me just before the meeting, you know, we can either run and or seek the bottle or we can go on our knees and, and, and seek a spiritual solution. Those are our options. That's, that's basically it, you know. Um, so, so my sponsor reminded me, A, that I'm not entitled to anything, <laughs> which downsized me. And then afterwards I realized also something else that she said to me was that, um, um, my relationship with others is a direct indication of my relationship with God. Because she asked me, so how's your prayer life? And you know, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm, I'm, I'm praying and I'm, I'm, I'm on my knees every morning. I'm going there. I, I do what I need to do. I read and I do. Um, and I'm praying all these prayers. Um, you know, but you know when you're sick and you have this constant pain and it just doesn't go away. And it sort of reminded me of, of when I was still drinking my last year of drinking was when I, I prayed for a full year, you know, for God to just release me to please just, can I just get released from this disease that I have? Because at that stage I knew I had a problem with alcoholism or with alcohol. And, um, and it went on for a full year. And, and I believe this praying now because I'd pray and then I'd drink and then I'd pray and I'd be remorseful and then I'd drink and then I'd pray and I'd be remorseful and you know, like that. Um, so now this period now has felt sort of similar where I'm praying, but you know, next morning, and I go in there with hope and, and faith. And, and next morning I wake up with a heck of a lot of pain because I go to bed thinking tomorrow is going to be better. But then I wake up with a pain. And then, you know, I get to a point where I go into that room and I just sit and I cry because I don't know what to tell God anymore. Um, so, and then she told me this. And then it hit me, but, you know, <laughs> actually, actually I'm resentful towards God. Actually, actually I'm, I'm not happy with him. At this point in time, and, and that is why my relationship with others are not going that well, you know, because in real life, I'm upset with God because I've been asking and I've been telling and I've been pleading and, and I'm, I'm just, I'm still staying sick, you know, I'm not getting any better. And then once I realized that, once I wrote that out, once I just at least admitted it to myself and another person, I immediately felt some sort of relief. You know, there was, there was this relief already just because I don't know about you, but for me, it's difficult to, to, to say that I'm upset with God, you know, <laughs> especially, you know, since I'm in recovery and, and I'm a Christian and stuff. It's like I've been taught never ever to be upset with God. And so, um, it was difficult for me to, to actually, to admit this. You know, to say that I'm, I'm, I'm angry actually with my higher power. Um, but, but it was relief and I immediately felt release, you know, to a certain extent. Um, and I, and I started feeling forgiveness towards others. You know, it was easier then because she also reminded me about gratitude, you know, and, you know, I do a lot of readings on gratitude and, you know, the more I'm grateful, like coming through this morning and I'm, I'm looking at the mountains and I'm, I'm looking at Cape Town because I love this place so much. And the fact that I can actually drive today and move around and, and I think about my family and, and the fact that I'm happily married and, and all of the blessings that I actually do have, you know, the bad, and it's not really bad because at the end of the day, there's a lesson for me to be learned here, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, the bad sort of fades in comparison to, to, to what I have when I look at the friends, when I look at love, 
when I look at the beauty, when I focus on gratitude and not so much what is wrong with me, but with what is right with me and the world and not so much what's what, you know, what isn't. So, you know, I've, and another reason I was resentful towards God was because, you know, I'm supposed to, you know, be of service, clean house, trust God, be of service. And I couldn't be because now I'm, I'm stuck in bed. I can't get to sponsors. I can't, I can't sort of get to meetings the way I want to. I can't sort of do what I need to do. And so I'm like, why do you want me to do these things? But I can't, you know, and now I'm, <laughs> um, but in, in that, there's also a lesson. And I don't know. I, ca- I can't stand here today and say that I, that I know all the lessons. I, I, I don't know. What I do know at this point um, is that acceptance is the answer <laughs> to all my problems today. <laughs> um, I know that. And I can't also say that I've 100% accepted it, you know. But I do know that. I know it, you know. At least I've gotten through the worst of it. Um, I also know that, that, that I need to live in, in His grace one day at a time. You know, one step at a time, just for today. I need to live in His grace. Um, the beauty, like I said, the most difficult part about step four, any of these steps where you need to be honest, actually admit it to yourself and someone else, is, like I said earlier on, I, I don't want to see my defects of character. I don't like seeing my part in a situation. But the beauty of it is that I can actually, I can actually grow and I can stop and look at myself, just stop for a minute and stop feeling sorry for myself, <laughs> me, me, me. And I can stop and I can pause and I can look at myself. And sometimes I feel really miserable because I fall short of the ideal often. You know, often, very often I fall short of the ideal. But I want to close with, with something that I heard a couple of weeks ago. Um, we, um, someone was telling the story of, of two boys, Johnny and Peter. And, um, Johnny gets 90% for his math test because he's a math fundu. You know, he just, he finds maths so easy. You know, it's just natural. He doesn't have to study. His brother, Peter, isn't really good at, at maths, you know, so he gets 60%. And, you know, the two boys go to their parents and they show the reports and whatever, and the parents are very proud of, of Johnny for his 90%, like, well done and whatever. And they tell Peter that he needs to work harder, you know. Um, you know, 60% is, 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 is not good enough. Um, so Johnny, you know, he doesn't have to study because he's a math fundy. But Peter goes back and he studies really hard. You know, he sits up and he studies and he does whatever he needs to. And he works really, really, really hard because math doesn't come easy to him. It's not a natural thing for him. And so, you know, next report and, you know, Peter got 90, 90% again and, and Johnny got 65%. And I don't freak work. Well, like he worked himself stuck and oh, muck. And um, the parents are like oh, very proud of Johnny as usual, and, and and Peter's like, you know what, you, that's better, good, but you need to work harder. And you know, and Johnny is sort of like, oh, <laughs> you know, I've, I've really worked hard to get these results, you know. And and the model of the story, and and uh, so the lesson for me in it all is that, um, you know, people, humans, us as human beings, we are concerned about results, but end results about how things work out, whereas God is more concerned about effort. He looks at the effort that you put into something. You know, he's not so much concerned about the results um, because we make mistakes. You know, I've done things in my, in, my, in my drinking days and even in my sobriety that I regret and that hurt. Um, but as long as I follow this program, and as long as I do what I need to do, and even if it's difficult, even sometimes I don't want to, but eventually I do get to that because my sponsor's voice rings in my head, and then I'm like, ah, okay, you know, and I sit in, and I do what I need to do, and that's the thing, that for me is progress, not perfection, you know, is that he's concerned about the effort that I put in and not so much about about the results.
So, yeah, that's, that's my story. I can't believe I went on for 20 minutes until the red light went on. Well done. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Dina, no good laughing, my friend. You've got a lot of homework to do with me in future. A lot of homework. Sean, thank you for the lovely message, Dina. And to Chantel also. You know, I always tell, tell Dina, teach me the way to speak. When you know, you know, I'm not an educator. Teach me how to, you know, quote from the steps at this page and that page and this page and that page. He told me, are you stupid? I said, no, Dina, I'm not stupid, man. He said, what Bob said? Keep it simple, man. You're a simple man. Just try to keep your talk very, very simple. Thank you for that, Dina. Good morning, my friends. My name is Morris. I'm definitely an alcoholic. I'm very, very grateful to be here this morning. You know, I might have this very, very macho look at the strong body, but just underneath, I'm a very, very shy and simple and afraid character. You know, when they phoned me and told me that I'm a speaker at this convention, I said, yo! Everybody thought I caught the jackpot. Everybody in the office, but I said, what happened there? I said, no, they asked me to speak at the convention. She said, that for that, you're getting excited. I said, of course, I must be excited. Oh, it's an honor and a privilege to speak at a convention. She said, Dad, but you speak all the time, Dad. So what's the difference? I said, no, at the convention, hey, there's so much of people there. Hey, you know, I must speak at this meet. But as from yesterday, the feeling. But nevertheless, I'm so grateful to be here this morning. I'm so happy to be here to see all the wonderful people. You know, while I'm standing here at this convention, I think about my first year. But I went to my first convention to Pretoria, and I put suit, at that time we were in the 90s, and I put suit and tie, we came in the front seat. And they asked anybody doing a convention for the first time, hey, we quickly put our hands with us and give us some souvenirs or something, you know what I mean? We put our hands. And there happened to be like four teachers and a shoemaker now. So these four uh, teachers, hey, they quickly said, okay, luck. Hey, I said, no, 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 no. They said, come up, come up. Oh, God, I came up. Oh, I want to pee. I want to go down now. Oh, I'm feeling uncomfortable. And anyway, when I got up to the mic, hey, I'm back to you know tabla, you know tabla? Hey, they were knocking, I'm shivering, and I'm gonna pee. And I just said I'm an alcoholic, hey, and everybody started clapping. I said, what are they clapping for now? Oh. And after I spoke, I don't even know what I spoke about. Hey, they all stood at the queue and they're shaking my hands. And that's what I expect you to do today also, okay? <laughs> <laughs> My friends, you know, like always did I say, it's, hey, hey, it's so simple because for me, I don't make it very difficult and very complicated because as I told you, I'm a very simple man. I'm just thinking, and I'm always, always grateful to God for this wonderful, wonderful fellowship. I'm just thinking about my last bout of drinking. You know, when they talk about blackouts, my last bout was about blackout. I was very, very fortunate at my final stage of my drinking, for about six or eight months before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I only used to drink one day a week. Not that I wanted to drink one day a week, because my system could not take it anymore. Every time I drank, I became very, very sick. Very, very violently sick. I could be like a macho that night, show every, impress everybody how much I could drink, how I could handle the drinks. But next day, oh God. The mornings were fine, but as I was, the day was going along, drinking raspberry, drinking uh, was this citrus soda, Eno's, everything that they spoke about I had. By 2, 3 o'clock, I would just start becoming ill, couldn't manage, and I couldn't sleep, I couldn't stand, I couldn't sit. That's how it used to be. So I just wanted to cut down this drinking, but I didn't know how to do this. I remember my final... Day of drinking, I went on this heavy binge of, not binge, I say, with night drinking. Came home late at night. You know, they talk about blackout. The next morning I got up as usual, and I'm off, I'm sick, sick, sick. I'm telling my wife, you know, you're a very, very miserable woman. She asked me, why? I said, no, I came last night. You didn't even care to, you know, offer me something to eat, and I'm feeling so hungry. She said, let me go to the lounge of that, that stage at a very small house, you know, one bedroom, one lounge, small lounge in the kitchen. She said, go see what you did in the lounge. 
I went there, I saw a heap of bones, no chops, bones. I said, did I eat all that? He said, who else was here last night? You know, they talk about blackout. And I was feeling sick. And a friend of mine, who I normally drink with, and he's always sick, but that particular day, he is nice and jovial, he's whistling, and he's coming up the, in my driveway. I'm thinking, what happened here? And my friend came with a new Mercedes. I thought, oh, they came to show me the new Mercedes, it's fine. And I was a person, I could never, ever, in all my drinking days, will never, ever drink when I'm bubbles. I could not. The guys say, what? Bite the dog that bit you. The only thing that can cure your bubbles is that I drink. I could not, because I used to be so sick. So anyway, my friends came to me in a nice, humble way, saying, look here, man, I'm going to AA. Would you mind coming? No, AA is saying, please, I don't want you to swear. I said, what's wrong? He said, look here, man, please, take an oath that you wouldn't swear. I said, okay, I take an oath, I wouldn't swear, because I am very used to vulgar words. So he said, no, I'm going to AA. I said, that's the best thing you ever thought about. You needed that. And yet the whole morning I've been vomiting and suffering. And he's telling me, please, I want you to accompany me because I'm feeling very, very ashamed to go. I mean, 25 years ago, you know, the youngster, there was not much young people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like now, there's so many young people here. To the youngsters, remember, I came in very young. But thank God I went to the t meeting and asked anybody doing an AA meeting for the first time, would you raise your hand? I didn't raise my hand because I came with my friend. He's got a problem, not me. <laughs> and if anybody know Bull's Room, the whole Bull's Room, should be, the roof used to be low, the ceiling, very low, and you can see my height. I had to bend down like this and go inside. And I went inside, I checked, hey, it's dark. And, you know, they got that eerie feeling. You know, first, uh, and plus I'm bubble last one, right? And that eerie feeling, and there, everybody's smoking. I said, God, plus I'm feeling uncomfortable. Hey, I came out, you know, like, very edgy, like, and, you know, agitated. I went, sat down, hey, I got up. Because this is not place for me. This is for my two friends that I came with. Because they got a serious drinking problem. They drink every day. I only drink once a week. But my friends, I always say, but for the grace of God. You know, the people, whoever is here, just believe that you're here by God's grace. Start off your own doing. Because me, I'm a living proof to that. And I didn't want Alcoholics Anonymous. But believe it or not, when I went the Saturday night, I just couldn't wait to get home now because I wanted to sleep. That Sunday when I got a fresh, hey, feeling nice. Ha! Ah, meeting starting 10 o'clock, there's two new guys, 8 o'clock by my gate. I said, what's wrong? Come on, now you must come with us. I said, hey, back to the same place. Yeah, come, let's go back. Yeah, Calgula Company. And my friend didn't have to speak that day, that's some 25 years ago. And he's looking at me and he's speaking. I'm thinking, how the hell does he know my story, like? He's looking at me because me, I didn't raise my hand, so I'm not a newcomer. You know what I mean? I kept quiet because I'm giving this towards the company. But my friends tell you, especially to the newcomers, believe what I'm telling you. This program works. Ever since the 25th of May, 1992, my life turned around 180 degree. Start to do this program one day at a time. I start to enjoy this program. As I, you know, everybody know my sponsor is Dina. Okay, didn't he only teaches me, you know, a bit of big words now and then to use. But it will just be simple, bro. It's working for you. Just keep it simple. My life has turned out to be different. Started to be better. When I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was looking old. Believe it or not. Stomach was all out. And I should like dressing. I should like standing, you know, nice style clothing and things like that. But this time, you know, when your belt started going like this, and this thing is turning around. But it didn't matter anymore to me. It didn't really matter because I got used to this. Though. When I was young, I was always just nice. I had a lot of hair. Go go to a salon, you not know, a nice salon, do my hair up. Hey, just as smart and all. But as the alcoholism progressed, I lost this. And as I was coming back into Alcoholics Anonymous, things started to change. And after two months place where I worked, I worked for a company, sweet place, that's why I'm so sweet. I work for Beacon Sweets. After two months, hey, I told the guys, hey, they all said that they should call me Langers. Hey, Langers, you're looking like eggs, eh? Hey, I told them, hey, 
bro, I'm going to AEA. After two months, I said, all right, I got two months under my belt. I said, I'm going to AEA. Hey, it was, it became a big story. Hey, long as I'm to AEA, sir. <laughs> but believe it or not, believe it or not, those guys were daily drinkers every day. You know, I'm being serious. After two months in Alcoholics Anonymous, you blindfold me and let each guy pass. I'll tell you which guy passing me. <laughs> That's how much, you know, I could smell the guys now. Because now by this time, now I start to stand perfume, you know what I mean? Shave, look lucky and go at party every morning, going to work. Out. I could smell these guys. And these guys say, hey, lung is going to hey. But I didn't mind because things are happening for me now. I'm looking lucky. At last I'm going to work early and things are coming right. But this time I moved, I must know, from a small house, a small rented place. I moved to my own place. I think things are going right. Then one day I was driving to Wentworth where the colored people stay. And I met one of the guys that used to work with me in construction. Hey, I met the guy, like, you know what I mean? Because I know he's a heavy drinker, like. Hey, I stopped and I went to, hey, how's the JB? He said, hey, Mori, you're looking lucky, eh, sir. Hey, I said, JB, I'm going to AA, bro. That's what's making me look like. Eh? Hey, Mori, you needed it, like, sir. <laughs> Believe it or not, this guy working in construction. While we were at work, he'll jump over the fence. Go down to the place where they drink. Hey, he'll drink, drink. Sometimes you go into the bar, you won't find him. And this was terrible. And yet he said, man, yet me, I was all. After work, I was a guy by his double brandy, full that thing up with ice. Coke and things like that. And this was time, hey, Mori, you need it, like, Well, anyway, my friend taught me, you know, telescopic vision. We can see other people's problems, but we can't see our own problems. But all right, I went along. But things just started to get better, better, better. Making meetings, plus I had two guys, my friend Mutu, my another friend, uh, late Rajan. He was moving every day. I just couldn't wait now, you know. I'm not a very learned guy, and these guys are teaching me things, and I am enjoying it. Let's go to the meetings. People are teaching you. Then, of course, Uncle NC and Uncle Biddy used to be there. We are young ones too, right? Hey, Uncle Biddy one day saw me now, took his, and Uncle Biddy is short. He took out his glasses, looked at me, saying, I saw you some way. Hey, I'm thinking, yeah, same uncle. I saw him a few years ago, and he... I told him, Uncle, I don't need it. I brought another friend. He looked at me and said, Nena, I saw you somewhere. I know it now. Hey, anyway, so now I felt bad as Uncle. I came to a meeting. When I went to that meeting, I took another friend with me. And Uncle Biddy invited me inside. I said, no, Uncle, not me. My friend got a problem, not me. Like, AA was like taboo for us at the time. But thank God, it just went on and on and on. And life just got better and better and better by the grace of God and this wonderful fellowship of our colleagues anonymous. Of course, no saint. Then another addiction takes over. Another, I got into business. My business started to do well. Hey, now I start to, I fly now, moving with the guys now, you know, moving here, moving there, jet setting. Not long after five years in Alcoholics Anonymous. But I was making meetings, but weekends I'm moving with all these high flyers. This place, you know, other addiction take over. And then 1996, things start crumbling. Things start falling apart. Because I was not paying at attention to my business now. I was paying attention to other things, other vices. My friends, I went through a very, very painful life. Very, very painful. Start to lose everything. I start losing everything because of this other disease an addiction. But I always say thank you, God. And I thank you to my wonderful friends, my friend Dina, my friend Stanley, and a few other friends. They was there by me. So don't worry. Dina is always telling me, bro, don't worry. Whatever happens, keep coming. And believe it or not, I used to make meetings that you not believe. When the things start to crumble, I start to come more to meetings. And when I come to meetings, I'm always laughing, joking. Everybody thinks things are fine, but things during the day were going terrible. Things were going terribly wrong. But God in his infinite wisdom, infinite wisdom, took all these material things away from me because to humble myself. And I'll never, ever forget what Uncle Buddy told me. You know, that's why they say people, some old people, there was a wisdom because I was a bit of a clever character. Though I was stupid also, but I always wanted to be the sharp one. 
Uncle Buddy told me, Nina, go down on your knees, humble yourself before God and pray and you'll see miracles that happen. Believe it or not, my friend, when everything was gone, then I start to humble myself. When I went to the lamp, I remembered what Uncle Biddy told me. Humble yourself before God. And then I went down on my knees and I started to pray. And I started to pray and ask God to please help me. Before that, I come to AA meetings, serenity prayer, the Lord's prayer, just say that and gone. But now I took the real son of going down on my knees and asking God, please help me. My friends, you know, when you talk about miracles and Alcoholics Anonymous, miracles start to happen. I'm telling this because I know a lot of people are going through a lot of pain in this part of the time in the economy. People are going through a lot of health problems. Miracles started to happen. And I always believe, don't look at somebody, judge, don't be judgmental. If you want to have a spiritual life, don't be judgmental of other people. Look at the good at other people and you'll see God will do good for you. Don't judge people. I mean, who they are. They might have nothing today, but don't judge them. Be, pray for them. You'd rather pray for them rather than judging other people. Because people are very good at judging others. People can find faults and morals, a lot of faults and morals. But yet morals have so much of love to offer. I might do one thing wrong. People take the inventory of my life. Don't do that. If you find morals got a defect of character, pray for him. Rather than finding faults in him. My friends, I just want to tell you, you know, the miracles that happened in my life. You know, I might say this, but I want you to believe it if you want to. My sister, when she was 33 years old, they diagnosed she had cancer. Age. And my youngest sister, she had cancer. And they phoned me by this time. To the, she got it when she was 30, by 33, she was on the way out. They phoned me on a Friday. You must come now. Hey, you know how to feed. You know the feed. And I used to phone her during the course of the day. How are you doing? You know? And she used to always say, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm okay. I should tell her, take, your, take all this. My friends, when I went there, you know, to see your sister. She was nice, lovely, tall. Now she's shrunk. Oh, and she's full of pain. She couldn't eat for like two weeks because she had this lip was all sore and she was shrinking. Hey, and I saw her. I started to cry. I started to cry. Because your younger sister to see her like that. Anyway, that Sunday we're leaving, but before we could leave, people gathered around to do the pray, you know, to pray. And we thought anytime my sister is going to pass on. They, so, they, you know, I'm Hindu by faith. My sister is Christian. So the people of the Christian faith was there, and my, my mother and everybody, we all started to pray. They carried her like a small baby, and I should become a baby. They carried her and brought her in the lounge, and everybody started to pray, and I went outside. And I cried out to the God of my understanding. I said, God, why are you doing this to us? She's so young, and you're doing this to us. Hey, we are crying. Anyway, she felt good. Anyway, they took her back into the bedroom. You know, she had all these cancerous lumps on her legs, lips were all sore, no strength. Everybody was just praying and praying and praying. Because we thought any time she's going to die. My friends, anyway, she started to scream. Hey, we thought her life is going. Everybody just thought the bedroom was screaming, ma, ma, ma. Hey, my mother ran. We thought it's over. Believe it or not, my friends. When I talk about a miracle, Everything just disappeared. Everything just disappeared. And she got her strength. She said, Ma, look at here. And you could just see her coming. That is the power of prayer. That is the power of God. So my friends, if you want miracles to happen in your life, have implicit faith in God. Implicit faith in God. You'll find your life changing. To all you, my wonderful friends, I want to wish you all well. And may you stay the happiest joy and free in the fellowship of our colleagues. Thank God bless. It's good to be brought down to size.
Thanks. That's good. She doesn't hit me. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Walter, and I am an alcoholic. Sure. <laughs> Humbled, grateful, honored. This is, this is quite a gathering. Everything but fear. I know that every one of you, as I too, have been blessed with a gift of desperation. That we've all been there. That we all know where we've been and how hard we, we have worked and will continue to work if we want this, our program, to work. Gary... Thank you for, for your service to my panel of, of speakers. Thank you. Morris, you're a tough act to follow, but you're bigger than me, so that's cool. Far more shinier than me, it's also cool. And to a large degree, what this program has taught me is that it's okay. Whatever it is, it's okay. There are no definites. There are no guarantees. This program is, it's a gift of God. I believe it is a God-inspired program. But for the newcomers, I know what it feels like to be told about God. Ooh. God. The God concept. We're just a group of drunks getting over drinking with a good orderly direction that the 12 step program gives us. My very first sponsor said to me, Walter, the only thing you need to know about God, you're not it. I gotta tell you, that was a bitter pill to swallow. And I'd swallowed my fair share of, of more. My drug of choice was more. It was never enough. Whatever it was. If it was, whatever it was. <laughs> I'm grateful that the 12 steps are written in the past tense because although those days for me are in the past, I now live very present. And it is, it's, it's, it's a hell of an honor to stand in front of you and be present. I'm not one to read anything, but when we began, I just looked through the program and a prayer that, well, a song that we sing. Just something struck me about the topic that, that I've been asked to share on. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! the hour that I first believed. I believe that every day, now, it took a while, but now when I wake up in the morning and I give thanks for the blessings of a brand new day, I am right there and then given the blessing to practice what this new beginning and this journey entails. Life is not a destination. It's a journey. It's a journey that I pray will continue for as long as it's supposed to. We're all miracles. Every single one of us, I'm no exception. I have my stories. I have my stories of God that I now do believe in. 
and I know that I'm not it. But th- that grace, it's a bit by the grace of God, I stand before you and am able to try and fulfill my fifth tradition in carrying a message that there is hope out there and that this program does work if I am prepared to work it. It doesn't come for nothing. It is a very simple program that it is. But nobody ever promised me that this would be an easy program. The challenges that I've experienced in my recovery day by day, are what they are. They're challenges. It's, it's the curves, the, it's the life journey, the roads, the cobbles, the stones that I need to walk upon every day and would do so anyway, whether I was drunk or whether I'm sober. The difference for me is that now being sober simplifies matters greatly. I'm able to actually look at a situation and come to terms with the fact that it's okay. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be miserable. As long as for me that I don't wallow in it. The ticket out of pity city is gratitude. It's a simple lesson but it's a lesson that's taken me a long while. I wallowed and wallowed and wallowed in my pity party, focusing on absolutely everything everybody else had, and poor little old me, what have I got? Well, you know what? I've got absolutely everything I need. I have goals, and I don't necessarily have everything I want. But by the grace of God, I have everything I need. I've learned amazing things in this journey, day by day, step by step. Nothing comes for nothing. We know that. Afrikaans says, Hut kwip kwip is dir kwip. If it comes easily, I don't know, me as an alcoholic, I don't want it if it comes too easily. I need to work for it. I need to feel at the end of the day that justification that says, I deserve my dop. I've worked at it. I've had a long, hard day. And I've earned it. It's mine. Don't take it away. You see, I wasn't a normal alcoholic like all of you. I never drank during the day. So that kept me in denial for a long time. The fact that when I did start drinking, I caught up really quickly. It makes me who I am. Gratefully, I knew before I came in that I was an alcoholic. I mean, this is nuts. I used to stand in front of the mirror, trashed, but stand in front of the mirror and practice, because that's the topic. The beginning of a lifetime practice. My name is Walter, and I'm an alcoholic. With the tears running down my cheeks, full of remorse and regret, and go and have another shot. I did. This is an honest program. I can't stand up here and deny that. I can't tell you that every day of my life is a walk in the park. But if I get my head out of my Jibenhaben, it's amazing what I can see. And it's, it's a beauty to see, to behold. We had a little bit of rain last night. Please, God, we'll get more. I've been away camping this whole week. And it did nothing but rain. <laughs> I wasn't even far away. I was 230 kilometers away in Swellendam. They don't need as much rain as we need, and they don't need as much rain as they got. But the farmers will doubt me. I'm grateful for the, far that, for the farmers. Want, alles dankbar für die Rien. Great. When you're camping and you're packing away canvas tents in the rain, it's glorious. But it gave me an opportunity to practice my program to practice the spiritual principles that the AA 12-step program have blessed me with. The fact that I know I don't have to be perfect, I just need to practice it. And by waking up every morning, I'm blessed with the honor to be able to practice for another day. And at the end of the day, when I do my 10-step inventory, I can give thanks. 
for the blessing of another day sober. Because I've got news for all of you. This is, this is something you've never heard before. It doesn't matter how long you've been sober. So if I had to say to you, sir, what time did you get up this morning? And you got up at five? You've been sober today longer than me. And to me, that is all that matters. Nothing separates us because I'm sober for however long. The beauty of this program is that right here and right now, I am sober, but by the grace of God, I tried many times to come sober on my own. I tried in isolation to cure my loneliness. I've learned all of these little things as I've gone along, as I've trudged my journey, and as I take my daily steps. This is my very first convention, and I'm truly honored to be sharing here. I've heard so many times how seize this opportunity we only live once you know what I've learned in this by this program is that I don't only live once I get the blessing if I'm grateful to live every single day I only die once and when they put me in a box I've reached my destination Every step and every day until that day, my journey, praise God, may continue. Now, I've got to tell you is that I grew up religious. I am not religious. I am spiritual. So it took me a long time in my recovery to come to terms with the idea, so what the heck is the difference? Firstly, in religion, well, firstly for me, I need all the help I can get. So if I do add in a little bit of religion with it, Great. But my primary purpose is to be spiritual. Religion for me is the eyes of God conveyed to me through the eyes of someone else. A preacher, a rabbi, an imam, a whatever. Somebody, my mother, my father, my grand. You will do this or God's going to do his thing. For me, spirituality is a simple thing. Firstly, I need to respect all living things. That there is a creator that is greater than me. And for me, spirituality personally is my direct connection with a power greater than myself and a God of my own understanding. Somebody that I can turn to in hours of need and say, this is bigger than me. Help me, please. The day that I stood up in my very first AA meeting and said, hello, everybody, my name is Walter. And I am an alcoholic. You know, I had the, the most unbelievable acceptance, lesson in acceptance, in my first 14 months of recovery. I was in recovery when I finally woke up one morning and said, Oh my God, I actually cannot drink for the rest of my life. I panicked. The shit hit the fan. I threw all my toys out the cot. I went straight back to fear mode. I rolled over in my bed. I was too afraid to breathe. I didn't exactly all the things, the shame, the guilt, the remorse, when I used to wake up in the morning after a night before that I never remembered anyway. I would wake up with that fear. That morning and for three days after it, until my sponsor said to me, it's fine, it's okay. You can't drink for the rest of your life, but you don't have to do the rest of your life all at once because that's impossible. You just can't drink now. Tomorrow, have a drink. Just don't drink now. The best advice I've ever received. It is. I've been through many things. My last rock bottom before I came in was a wedding. My fa I've got a brother in Toronto, in Canada. And my last rock bottom, there were many. I, well, my almost last. It was a bad one. Anyway, I spent... Okay. I didn't see the red light. <laughs> my name is Walter and I'm an alcoholic thanks for listening I hope you enjoyed the podcast Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links thank you very much